subject he's God in every situation he's God in every situation look at your neighbors and neighbor he's God in every situation hallelujah father bless us now may we do no damage but preach that which becometh sound doctrine and gospel in Jesus' name. Amen. He's God in every situation. Today's message is designed to remind us that the God of the Bible is God everywhere. He's God in every situation. He rules in every situation. What a mighty God. The Jerusalem Bible says, concerning our text, the town is pleasant, but the water is foul and the land suffers from miscarriages. The Holloman Study Bible renders this, the location, the city's location is good. But the land is bad, and the water is foul, and the land is bad. That means that God is God in every location. The word situation and location are interchangeable. Situation comes from a Hebrew word which means a dwelling place, a stay, a time of abode, inhabitants of a place, the site of a town. The Hebrew word is uh, moshab, and you probably won't remember that. Uh, but in our text, the way the word is used, it is clear that they're speaking of a location, a town. Amen. That he's God in every situation. He's God in every location. It'll make sense in just a moment. In our text, we see the miraculous hand of God in four locations, dealing with four situations. We're going to look at all four. We see Number one, a city in crisis. Number two, we see the man of God whom God has recently anointed with the anointing of the prophet Elijah being disrespected by wicked children in the capital of idolatry. Bethel was the capital city of idolatry in Samaria, at that time, I know that the word Bethel means house of God. But at that time, in the northern kingdom, remember, uh, Jeroboam set up gods and false places to worship, both in Bethel and in Dan. Bethel was the southern location. It was ground zero for idolatry. So we see the city in crisis, and that city was Jericho. We see the man of God being disrespected on his way uh, as he traveled uh, going from uh, Jericho, heading uh, down to uh, Bethel. And um, we also see the nation in chapter 3 in crisis. And finally, we see a poor widow in crisis. 
thing that I wish for you to pay attention to is that none of the situations, whether it was the nation in crisis, down to the widow in crisis, neither of the crisis, none of them was either too large for God to handle, nor too small for the Lord to pay attention to. What a mighty God. He's God who cares about the country, but he's also God who cares about the widow and all in between. God bless you. What a mighty God we serve. He's God today, saints, where I am. And he's God where you are. Praise the Lord. He's God everywhere. It's one of the prayers of Bishop Mason. God heal everywhere. Everywhere. He's, he's God everywhere. We can't let the devil cause us to put God in a box and to make the Lord small. He's God everywhere. He, nobody's life is perfect. Everybody's dealing with something. Someone has uh, some type of crisis going on. We all need the Lord's help in some way. The good news is that he is a helper. Hallelujah. He loves to help. Psalms uh, 33 and 20 says, Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Psalms 46 and 1 says, God is our refuge and a very, very present help in trouble. Every time I read Psalms 46 and 1, Mother, I hear Elder Turner uh, because I, I, I read that passage one time and uh, I read it and I, I called myself quoting it and I said, our God is a very present help in times of trouble. They were a little stricter than we are now because, you know, people were made of tougher stuff. You were good folk now, you might as well wave them goodbye. They don't come to church no more. My pastor told me, he said, it didn't say times of trouble. It just says trouble. And I, looked at, I looked at the passage and I, I corrected it. And so every time I read it, I hear him saying, it doesn't say times of trouble. It says trouble. Our God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Say amen. Psalms 121 and 1 says, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. In all three of these passages, the word help is translated aid. Our God will aid us. He'll help us. Hebrews 13 and 6 says, so that we can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. Uh, I will not fear what man can do unto me. In Hebrews 13 and 6, the word helper carries the idea of a, a chain or a rope uh, uh, for uh, frapping a vessel. And the way you uh, frap a vessel is you take a vessel and you take a rope and you wrap it around it so as to strengthen it. God knows how to wrap cables around us so as to make us stronger. And when, when life is coming at you, we serve a God who will, who will frap us, praise the Lord, make us stronger so that we won't come unglued. Because the devil wants you to come unglued when pressure comes, but the Lord knows how to wrap some things around where he'll give you power to hold yourself together. What a mighty God we serve. He's a helper. God Almighty. He's a help in trouble. Yes, sir. So let's look at our text and let's see what the Lord has to say uh, to us. Now let's quickly take a look at the first crisis. And let me lay the foundation for you. First of all, First and Second Kings is said to have been written. That the author is, in terms of just proving who the author is, the author is unknown. But it is said that the, the, the prophet Jeremiah 
is credited by many with being the author of First and Second Kings or a group of prophets. At the time here in Second Kings, which is a continuation, of course, of First, uh, Israel, Israel being the northern kingdom, was at war with Moab because uh, uh, Ahab uh, had been killed. And uh, Ahab, you know, he was a wicked king, married to the wicked Jezebel. And uh, his son, uh, Azariah, had taken over. Well, when his son Azariah became king, uh, Misha, the king of the Moabites, decided that he would no longer pay tribute to the king of the northern kingdom, uh, which uh, put an economical distress on uh, the Moabites. So he rebelled against uh, the northern kingdom. This is the context of our text. And what happened here was Elijah, uh, the prophet, had not died yet, had not, well, had not been taken away. Elijah was still very much alive, large, and in charge, coming to the conclusion of his ministry. Azariah, uh, the king, uh, had rebelled against God, and what he did was he fell. He had a freak accident. He fell and he got sick. Now, instead of sending uh, to Elijah or to someone who represented Yahweh to find out whether or not this sickness was unto death, he sends to the God of Ekron, this God whose name is Beelzebul. Beelzebul. Sounds just like Beelzebul. Beelzebul was, the, the name literally means Lord of life. The Hebrews mocked his name and called him Beelzebub, which is Lord of flies. You know, I know we live in a day now where we're trying to walk in diversity and we wouldn't dare mock another religion. We wouldn't mock another God because we treat all religions as though they're the same. They're not the same. They're not the same. There's only one true religion. There's only one true and living God. Praise the Lord. Us and the Muslims can't be right. Because the, the so-called God of the Quran and the God of the Bible are not the same. So they can't be right. The, the religions oppose each other. The God of the Bible and, uh, and Buddha, who had no prophets, Buddhism, no prophets, no God in particular, no set way to concentrate on. That can't be the same as, as Christianity. God sent his son and he called him Jesus. Hallelujah. So uh, the, the Hebrews wasn't into this diversity. They mocked Beelzebub and called him Beelzebub. So uh, what happened was uh, uh, Azariah sent to Beelzebub. Big mistake. I'm going, I'm going to preach in a minute. When he sent to him, the angel told Elijah what the king did. Elijah, see, he sent to uh, Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, because this god was said to be the god of prophecy. So if you want to know the future, uh, this, this Ekron, is, he's the man. So now you, you see how, how Azariah was messed up. See, his mom and dad served Baal. So Baal, once uh, Ahab and Jezebel was killed, Baal lost a little bit of his luster. So now the new flavor of the month, God, is Ekron. See, I thank God uh, up room that we're not a flavor of the month church. That's why I don't get into all these fads and whatever the latest is. I don't, I don't bother with that mess because God's not into fads. The Bible teaches that God's truth endures to all generations. When you're walking in God's truth, God's truth is consistent. There's a consistency. We ain't gonna, we're not going to change our identity every 30 days. Here's what we're getting ready to do now. And, and every 30 or 40 days, there's a, we're having a, a makeover at Upper Room. No, sir. You pretty much know what to expect when you come. 
Bring your Bible. Because we're going to open the Bible and we're going to preach the word of God. Praise the Lord. Praise the, I could care less what, uh, what, the, what the famous TV preachers are talking about. I don't watch any of them. I don't get messages from them. I don't turn to the Christian networks to see what the latest, what, what's, what's in vogue so I'll know what to preach. Anytime we preach something that's, the, that, that's similar, just know that it's God. Because I get my word from the Lord. I asked the Lord last week, God, what do I preach Sunday? The Lord said, open your Bible. Get up and meet me early. I'm going to let you preach from three or four chapters. I said, okay, God. Let's roll. So Elijah heard that he sent to the God of Ekron. I got to move on. Elijah said, you want a prophecy? Oh, you, it, it, is it not because there's no God in Israel? You mean to tell me there's no God in Israel? So you got to sin to the God of Ekron? He says, if you want a prophecy, I'll give you a prophecy. Oh, this is chapter one. You're going to die. You're not going to get well. There's your prophecy. So, so, so when he told the king's men that, the king's men went to uh, uh, Azariah and, and told them. He says, why are you back so soon? Well, why haven't you gone to seek the God of Ekron? They said, well, we met a preacher. And he told us to go back and tell you that you're going to die. He said, describe him to me. He said, well, he had long hair. And said he dressed kind of funny. The king said, that ain't nobody but Elijah. <laughs> then he said, Send some men to go get him. So he got a captain of 50 and gave the man 50 men. And the men went down to where Elijah was. And they found Elijah tending to his own business. Can I get a witness? And uh, when they found him uh, tending to his own business, uh, the man was dumb. The, 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 the captain of 50 with his 50 soldiers said to Elijah, look, the king has sent for you. Come right now uh, and make, make haste. Elijah sitting there in his house says, if I be a man of God, lightning, going, uh, fire will come down from heaven and burn up all y'all. Bam, God struck a lightning bolt and killed them all. The word got back to the king. The king sent another man. Captain of 50 with 51 men. They went down there. Found Elijah. Uh -huh. They were done. Hey, we've been sent by the king of Israel. You've got to come and see what the king wants. Elijah says, if I be a man of God, lightning, a fire will come from the sky and kill all of you. Bam, kill them. All right, the king got 50 more. I wouldn't have gone. I just would have said, you know what, you know what, uh-uh, no, here, here's my spear, here's my sword, call me what you want, I'm deserting, call me bold bird dog, call me what you want. Went down there, but this man had some sense. He walked up to Elijah, he said, first thing he did was he swallowed. And he said, now, please, sir, would you, I, look, I know what has happened with, with the last two groups. Said, would you count my life dear? And, 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 and listen, I beg you, would you please, if you will, man of God, accompany me to go see the king. I, please, I, we know we can't make it. <laughs> Elijah said, all right. <laughs> he looked at him and uh, the angel of the Lord said, go with them. And he went and went before the king and told the king, he said, look, you wanted a prophecy. You didn't ask God. You asked Beelzebub. Here's the prophecy. You're going to die. You're not going to get up from this. And the man died. He died when he was only king for two years. All this will make sense as I go into the message now. I'm teaching you. And, and so his brother, his brother who we're reading about in chapter 3, Jehoram took over. But but the rebellion of the king of Moab took place in chapter 1, verse 1. 
We won't revisit that right now until we get to chapter 3. So the scene changes. And it goes to, and I won't spend time on this one right now, when it's time for Elijah to be taken away. Elijah, Elisha stays with Elijah, and you know what happens. That as they walked, a whirlwind came, separated the two, and took Elijah up in a whirlwind. Elisha was left there, and he picked up his pastor's mantle and smote the Jordan waters and said, where is the spirit of Elijah? And the waters divided. And uh, the sons of the prophets saw him walk across, and they said, the spirit of Elijah doth rest upon Elisha. And so his career has, uh, had gotten started. With that miracle, the text tells us in verse 19 that the men of Jericho, the men of Jericho, uh, they take e Elisha and show him the city. And they said to him, here's our situation. The city is in a wonderful location. Everything is pleasant in the city, but the truth, as you can see, everything is nice. But how many know that all things are not as they appear? See, looking around in here today, everything looks so pleasant. You all look so happy. Most of you. A few of you look like you just got up and left your personality at home. But uh, most of you look. But you know what? Things are not always as they appear. He said, the location looks good. The situation is pleasant. But we have a problem. He said, the water here is foul. And we're in an agrarian society. And we're cattle, uh, we're ranchers. We're farmers and ranchers. But because the water is foul, the crops won't grow. And all of our cattle miscarry. Or they're barren. Now, you know, any way you look at it, even though the city looked fine, the city was in trouble. Because if the water is bad, and if the crops won't grow, and if all of the animals are miscarrying, there is no multiplication. And it's just a matter of time before that town dies. See, this is, here I go again, this is why I talk so much about uh, and against abortion. Everybody understands the importance of multiplying, but black folk. We vote for politicians and for policies that hurt our multiplication. It's the dumbest thing. I'm, I, I, as long as I have breath in my body, and God give me to talk about it, I'm going to bring it up. Because I know that if you don't multiply, you are going to die. When Israel was in bondage, God said, whatever you do, multiply. By, why do you think, what do you think was in God's mind when the Bible said, it is not good that the man should be alone? Now, it's amazing to me how people read stuff in the Bible that's not there. Yes, uh, the Bible said that Adam was lonely. That's not in the Bible. That's the, Adam, was, Adam was not lonely. As, as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, uh, there's no reference to Adam ever being lonely. Adam had a job. Adam was preoccupied. God had to show Adam that there was nobody like him. Because Adam was busy working that garden, and Adam uh, was naming all the animals, and that's when he noticed that there was no mate for him. But God brought the animals to him. Why was it not good that the man should be alone? The reason why it was not good is that the human race could not multiply. That's, right, That's why That's right. homosexuality and lesbianism is, couldn't be more anti-human. Couldn't be more wrong because there's no multiplication. A man can't get a man pregnant. Uh, children don't come from there. Praise the Lord. 
Women, you can lick and lap all over all you want, but spit don't germinate. Preach wouldn't. It takes me to say it. It takes me to say it. To say it like it should be said. Praise God. Why well, there's no misunderstanding. It, and then when you throw in this, uh, uh, this abortion, it kills our multiplication. Now, the men of Jericho, they understood. If our animals keep miscarrying, oh God, or if they are barren, why well, every man in here ought to get married. And if you get married, get some children. And if you can't get any children, adopt some children. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. You need to multiply. Amen. And you need to do it in that order. In that order. Preach wouldn't. Yes. When the time is right, that's part, that's part of the essence. That's part of the essence. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. Praise the Lord. We are progenitors. Yes. We carry the seed. Yes. And the seed is carried, when you carry the seed, it is to father and continue, praise the Lord, your name, your legacy, your life. Oh, I'm right. Bible said that when Abraham paid tithe to Melchizedek, Isaac and Jacob paid tithe also. Well, where were they? They were in his loins. They were in his loins. They hadn't even been born yet. But when he paid tithe, they paid tithe. Now somebody better come get me. I done got excited up here. Praise the Lord. See, you, you thought that today's sermon was going to be a yarn, but it ain't going to be no yarn, baby. I, gotta, I have something to tell you. And uh, they understood. We got to multiply. Black folks talking about, well, I can't stand Trump. Trump hates black people. But, but you love you love Hillary, who loved Planned Parenthood, who praised Margaret Sanger, Sanger, the biggest killer of black folk in the history of the country. There's something wrong with us. And your preachers won't tell you. There is no life without multiplication. The crops won't grow. The cattle miscarry, or they're barren. They brought the crisis, the crisis to the man of God. The man of God said, "Bring me salt in a not. Bring me salt. Now listen to this. The Bible is something in a new bowl. God is getting ready to do a new thing. Hallelujah." Oh, I'm going to show you in a new, a new bowl, new, a new thing. See, you see, the, the new bowl. Do you, do, do you see that in the text? Thank you for watching God First with Bishop Patrick L. Wooden Sr. and the Upper Room Church of God in Christ. To experience this message in its entirety, call 877-463-3477 to purchase a DVD or CD. God First will return next week at the same time. Until then, make every day a God First day. God First.